right, if you'll open with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're starting a uh, four-part mini-series this morning, and then we'll return to Mark after that. I'll say a little bit more about that here in a little bit. Um, But Galatians 5 is is where we are this morning. I want you to imagine with me uh, that you, you buy a piece of property, right? And on that property is a stand of apple trees, at least so you are told, right? The problem is when you buy this property, it's January, and so there's no leaves on the tree, much less any fruit. Uh, there's just branches, right? It's just these sticks sticking up out of the ground. Now, I suppose there's some way to tell if these are really apple trees, uh, but your average person isn't really going to know, right? You, you just you see these bare trees, and so you just take their word for it, right? Okay, these are apple trees. So you buy the property, and then spring comes along, summer, fall, there's nothing. Not a single one of them produce any apples. You might begin to doubt that they are, in fact, apple trees. And that's especially the case if they start dropping walnuts or something, right? Then, then you know for sure, okay, these are not apple trees. You know, Scripture uses fruit as an analogy for the different qualities that uh, should be characteristic of believers. Um, for example, Jesus uh, himself, he says, you shall know them by their fruits, right? We see it all throughout uh, scripture, this idea of, of fruits bearing testimony to who you are, right? You shall know them by their fruits. But what exactly is this fruit, right? Especially if we're talking about Christians. Christians are to have certain kinds of fruit. Well, what kind of fruit? What does it look like? Well, that's what we see in our passage in Galatians on the fruit of the Spirit. So there are nine fruits of the Spirit. Um, I actually memorized these as a kid uh, uh, with, with a song. You know, songs are really powerful things, right? There are so many scriptures that I know because I memorized a certain song as a kid. It makes me think, you know, we should probably be more intentional with our kids about scripture songs uh, because I want my kids to know the fruit of the Spirit and, and all these other things, right? So, so the way I know it, just uh, kind of a cheesy song, it would start off and say, uh, you want to be a fruit of the Spirit? Well, you can't be a coconut, and you, you'd say a different fruit. Right? You can't be a banana, and then it would go on to say, but the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And uh, it's, uh, the, these, these are, the again, the nine fruits of the Spirit. And what we're going to be doing in this mini-series is, uh, this is the first of four, so this morning we're not going to focus so much on these fruits, but we're going to look at this whole passage, right? So this is going to be an overview of this passage, which includes the fruit of the Spirit. But then uh, the next three weeks, we're just going to take three at a time, right? So uh, next week the sermon will be love, joy, peace, and then patience, kindness, goodness, and then faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So each sermon will have three, okay? Um, So let's go ahead now and and read the passage. If you'll stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, uh, Galatians 5, beginning in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you, will not un- you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. God, as we look at this passage as a whole this morning, I pray that you will um, help us to see uh, 
In particular, the contrast, contrast of the desires of the Spirit versus the desires of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. Lord, and help us to um, not only to see the, the contrast of these, uh, but, to, but to see that uh, as those who are in Christ Jesus, that you have made us to produce good fruit. And so help us to walk in the Spirit. Help us to, uh, in fact, produce these fruits. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, there are two big contrasts made in this passage, and that's kind of how we're going to look at it this morning. Um, the first is the desires of the flesh versus the desires of the Spirit. And then next, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. All right. So first, the desires of the flesh versus the uh, desires of the Spirit. Now, it's important. Uh, we see the word flesh a number of times in this passage. It's important for us to understand that uh, it's not referring literally to the body or literally to our skin, right? Um, or even to physical impulses, although it does include that. Rather, the reference to the flesh here uh, in a more figurative way is uh, it's referring to our sinful nature, right? The flesh, the sinful flesh. It's, it's similar to the way the Bible uses the word world, all right, have you ever considered this, like John 3.16, for example, it says, For God so loved the world. Now here, it's being used in a more literal way, right? God so loved the world. He loves the world as the people in the world, right? God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. But we're also told, do not love the world or anything in it. Well, wait a second, does it say God so loved the world, but we're told not to love the world? Well, it's using it in two different ways, right? And in fact, when we look in Scripture, we see uh, perhaps most of the time the word world is used in a more figurative way, often with a negative connotation, right? Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil, these are all our enemies. Uh, there's warnings against worldliness, right? And so whenever the Bible uses the word world, oftentimes it's using it in a kind of figurative way, uh, and it does have a negative connotation. And that's the same thing with the word flesh, right? It's not talking literally about our skin or our, or our bodies, but it's, it's talking about our sinful nature, okay? And so that's what we see here in this passage. Now, in a sense, we die to our sinful flesh at the moment of our conversion, in fact, it even says it in verse 24. It says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Or Romans 6, 11, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Right? So in one sense, the flesh has been crucified with Christ. It is dead. And yet... Scripture is clear that there are vestiges of the old flesh, of the old self or the flesh that remain and must be resisted. And we actually see it in this passage. In fact, we kind of see in this passage both of these truths, right? We, we see in verse 24 that it's been crucified, and yet we're told to resist it as if it's still there, as if it's still um, something to be, um, to be aware of. It's as if our sinful flesh, although crucified with Christ, is like a zombie that rises up against us, right? It's something that must continually be fought. Or uh, to give maybe another somewhat morbid illustration, not only is it like a zombie, but uh, have you ever heard of, or maybe you've seen this even, like if you cut the, the head of a snake off? Like apparently um, up to like 90 minutes, right? There's, there's been instances in which the head of a snake, after it's been severed, you know, can still bite someone like after an hour and a half, right? And so, uh, so maybe that helps a little bit to illustrate the fact that something can be dead, it can, it can receive a mortal wound, and yet there is still something to be resisted, something to be contended with. And that's, that's what we see in the Scripture. It's, and it's kind of like, you know, with a lot of aspects of our salvation, we see on one hand there's like a once and for all type element to it, but then there's a continual element as well. Like when we come to faith in Jesus, we are justified, right? We are made right before God. We are forgiven of our sins right then and there. 
But then that's just the beginning of a process that continues of becoming conformed into the image of Christ, right? So that's justification and sanctification. There's that uh, punctiliar event, that that one-time event, and then there's the continual process. And so that's kind of how it is with the flesh. Like in one sense, we have been crucified with Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. And yet, again, there's still these vestiges of the old self that we must contend with. And again, in our passage, we see that. We see that there, is, there are these desires of the flesh that we must resist even though the flesh has been crucified. All right, so um, verses 16 through 17, let's look at, look at that again. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing what you want to do. And so we see that there's, there's, some, there's some conflict, right, between these competing desires. The desires of the Spirit and the desires of the flesh. And that last line in particular it reminds me of something else Paul says in Romans 7. So again, that last line, it says, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Um, it reminds me of Romans 7, 19, where Paul says, For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want to do, I keep on doing. Right? Uh, Paul, Paul has personal testimony to this struggle. And what we see there in Romans 7, uh, this, this is the result of the flesh prevailing. But we're told in our passage this morning that if we walk by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Right? That ultimately... The Spirit will prevail if we walk by the Spirit, if we indeed have the Spirit. I think we can make that conclusion as we look at the passage as a whole. And and really, Paul does the same thing in Romans, right? In Romans, uh, he goes on uh, to say, okay, on one hand, we have this this battle uh, of of the Spirit and the flesh, but uh, if we walk by the Spirit, um, this, this, this is what it's going to look like, and that's what he goes into in Romans 8. Okay, so we see, we see Paul kind of, he uses the same kind of language, the same kind of arguments in different places. And so, um, I, think, I think that we, we all in our personal experience that we can testify in one way or another to these competing desires that Paul describes, these desires of the flesh versus the desires of the uh, spirit. Um, at, at a risk of, of trivializing this, um, I, I think that my struggle with Oreos is probably a pretty good example, okay? So, um, on one hand, I want to be healthy. I want to be fit, right? But on the other hand, Oreos are really good. I mean, some, some, <laughs> I think it was just a few nights ago, I was, I was sitting there eating some Oreos on the couch. I said, man, Oreos are just so good. Like, how do they make them so good? I don't know, I'm just, I'm just a sucker for Oreos, right? Um, so so there, there are these competing desires, right? There's, in so many things, there's competing desires. There's the hierarchy of desires, right? We, we desire one thing, and yet um, our ultimate desire is, is ultimately what's, is going to be what wins out, right? And, uh, and I, I make light of that. I mean, you know, of course, even, even that can be a serious thing, uh, you know, uh, struggles with food or whatever. Um, because understand that, that sins do not always come in the form of doing strictly forbidden things. But sometimes they can just come in the form of excess, right? Or, or making idols of something. And so whatever that might be, fill in the blank, we all ought to be aware of that. And as, as we think about these competing desires, uh, again, recognize that it's, it's not always things that are strictly forbidden, but sometimes it's just things in excess or making idols of things. But here's the million-dollar question, right? As, as we see in the first part of this section, we see Paul speaking of these competing desires. The million-dollar question for us is, how, how do your spiritual desires compete or compare? How do they compare with your fleshly desires? So, for example, your desire to know and follow and be like Jesus, right? On one hand, you might have that desire to know and to follow and to be like Jesus. But then on the other hand, you may have desires for, for worldly pleasures, for the praise of man, for, for sin, for, for fill, fill in the blank, for all kinds of things. How do these 
desires compare with one another. Of course, we're all at different places in our walk, and praise God that though our sins are many, His mercy is more. But we ought to have an increasing desire of the Spirit that increasingly prevails over the desires of the flesh. And if we don't have that, well, there's good reason to be alarmed, right? Because what we're going to see, again, as, as, Jesus, uh, as Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. And so as, as we have these competing desires, again, ultimately our greatest allegiance is going to um, prevail. Our greatest desires are going to, uh, are going to win. And so um, we ought to have an increasing desires, increasing desires of the Spirit that increasingly prevail over the desires of the flesh. When we see in this passage these commands... Uh, to walk by the Spirit, or in verse 18, to be led by the Spirit. Uh, we, we must understand this is not optional. It's not, Paul isn't saying, hey, if you want to be a super Christian, like here's what you ought to do. But he's saying that this is the evidence that you have the Spirit, right? That you have the Spirit, well, it's evidenced by walking by the Spirit, by being led by the Spirit, by having the fruit of the Spirit, right? Uh, this is the evidence, this is the fruit of being a Christian, of having the Spirit dwelling within you. All right, and so, so first we see, again, this um, uh, competition between the desires of the flesh, which, again, we all have to struggle against. So we have this ve- these vestiges of the old self, but we have the desires of the flesh versus the desires of the Spirit. And we must walk by the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then next, we have the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit, which, of course, there's a similarity in in these two comparisons, but he talks about them in these different ways for a reason. So verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, uh, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, Divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice this this whole list of things, right? These works of the flesh. Notice these are not only outward actions, but also attitudes of the heart. Right? There's the mix in there, isn't, isn't there? Not only outward actions, but also attitudes of the heart. And this corresponds with what I said earlier concerning the desires of the flesh. Remember, the desires of the flesh, uh, they're not merely physical impulses, although they include that, but it's more, right? Again, it includes attitudes of the heart. So we won't have time this morning for me to comment on all of these works of the flesh, but ultimately I think what we see here is that it's really just representative of all sin because notice the phrase, after he gives this long list, he says, and things like these. Right? So he's just, he's just giving some examples. He's giving a representative sample here. The point is that while all sin is destructive, not all sin looks the same. So from sexual sin to idolatry, from anger to envy, from relational discord to drunkenness, right, fill on the blank. Paul says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what, is, what does this mean, right? Uh, is Paul saying that, okay, if you slip up and you commit one of these sins, or, or, or if one of these sins happens to describe the attitude of your heart, that therefore you will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, first of all, without Jesus, yes, right? The wages of sin is death. But, but, but what Paul is getting at here is, 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 not, is not a standard of perfection, but I think, again, he, he's talking about these are the things that characterize one kind of person, while the fruits of the Spirit are going to be what characterize another kind of person, right? That is, a person who is lost versus a person who is saved, a person who uh, does not inherit the kingdom of God versus a person who does inherit the kingdom of God. And so Paul does not have in view here, um, when he lists all of these different 
uh, works of the flesh. He does not have in view here the struggles and failings of a repentant person. Right? It's not the repentant person who loves Jesus and is seeking to live for God and yet stumbles and falls and misses the mark in, these, in, in various ways. He's not talking about the struggles and failings of a, a repentant person, but rather a continual, deliberate practice of unrepentant sin. And we, we see this in many other places in the Scriptures as well, right? We see, uh, we see these lists of sins, that, and Paul will straight up say, you know, such a person will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians is another place. Uh, similarly in, well, at least those two places. Um, and so, this can describe, of course, someone who has never professed to be a follower of Christ, right? Someone who's just living in a uh, continual, deliberate pattern of unrepentant sin, right? They've never even professed to be a Christian. But it may also describe someone who has professed to be a Christian at some point. So let's begin with the first. Understand, uh, those who have never professed faith in Christ, uh, for such people, it's often holding on to sin that keeps them from doing so. I think this is important for us to understand. You know, just, just in our Sunday school class this morning, we were talking about uh, evangelism and the need to be born again, right, of this spiritual transformation. And, uh, and, and we, were, we were talking about how, okay, you, you can't just convince a person of some facts and that's the end of it right? There has to be some kind of spiritual transformation. In fact, there has to be a turning from sin. And if a person is not willing to turn from their sin, if they want to hold on to their sin, then, you know, uh, you, can, you can argue as persuasively and eloquently as, as, as anyone could, and it's not going to do it, right? A person must be willing to turn from their sin. And so, um, a person, on the flip side, who is holding on to their sin, well, that's going to in many cases, keep them from even professing faith in Christ and certainly keep them, keep them from the kingdom of God. So one example that I think of in church history is Augustine. Uh, this was uh, during the, in the 300s, uh, many, many years ago. Um, Augustine, uh, well, spoiler alert, he became one of the most influential Christians in history. So there is a conversion story here, but it took him a long time to convert because he didn't want to let go of his sin, uh, specifically sexual sin, right? He, he, was, he was very given to uh, this particular kind of sin, and, and he knew that there was something special about Christianity, and he was, search, he was searching for something more, but at least right away he, he, he couldn't go to Christianity because he knew that there was a call to follow after Jesus, right? There was a call to turn from your sin and turn toward Christ, and he wasn't willing to do that. And so he studied all these different philosophies and was seeking to try to find some kind of meaning. He even followed this uh, religion of the time called Manichaeism, uh, but, but it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't working for him. And in fact, he, he, he uh, wrote one time of seeing this beggar on the street who was a believer, and this beggar on the street was happier than he was, even though he had become uh, quite the scholar and quite successful in many ways, and he had lots of wealth, and in fact, he was, he was living the life, right? He was living in his sin, the sin that he thought would make him happy, and yet he sees this beggar on the street that's happier than him. And so he was just struggling, right, because he was seeing the merits of Christianity, uh, of course, first of all, that, that it could bring him fulfillment, but also that it, that it was true, and yet he still was just not willing to let go. And so he was, he was struggling, even, even praying uh, to God uh, that, um, that he could find his way through this some way, somehow. And then he hears this child just, just uh, across the fence, this child apparently playing some game or something, uh, but the child says, pick up and read, pick up and read. And he was like, huh, that's odd. I've never heard that before. And so what does he do? Well, he, he says, okay, I'm going to pick up and read. And so he goes into his house. Uh, back then, you know, they didn't even have like all the scriptures bound together in one book typically. Uh, I think he had like some of Paul's epistles there on his coffee table or whatever kind of furniture they had back in those days. Again, this is the 300s. But he, he picks up his copy of, of Paul's epistles and he opens up 
just randomly, which, you know, I, I typically wouldn't, um, I typically wouldn't uh, advocate for this. You know, some people might kind of close their eyes and let their Bible fall open and, let's see, and turn away from evil. Huh, hey, actually, it actually worked pretty well right there. To turn away from evil is understanding. I don't know, maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm a convert to that practice. Uh, that was Job uh, 28, 28. So how about that? So, well, that's what he did. And, and, and here's, here's what he fell upon. Man, God's, God's teaching me something. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so here, here's, here's what he fell upon in Romans 13, verses 13 through 14. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Right? That's the passage he fell upon when he pick up, picked up and read. And, and it hit him, hit him like a ton of bricks because that's exactly what he needed, right? To, to, to not live in sexual immorality and sensuality and all these things. That These things were keeping him from the kingdom of God. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. It's actually very similar wording to our passage this morning, right? Um, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so he read those words and he was converted and God used him again in, in incredible ways and one of the most influential Christians in church history. And so... Um, but, but that was to illustrate, at least in the first part of his struggle, right, these sins were keeping him from professing faith in Christ. But then what about the person who wants to have their cake and eat it too? Right? The person who says, well, I'm a Christian, and yet their life is characterized by the works of the flesh. Right? The, this whole list of things that we just read. And, and the person says, yeah, I know these are sins. I, I, I know... Uh, I know it's a sin, but I won't stop even for Jesus. Right? That's, that's a phrase you've often heard me use. I actually picked that up from a pastor that I served under years ago. Uh, it's just, just a very simple way to express what unrepentant sin is. right? Because, again, we all struggle with sin, right? But there's a the big difference between struggling with sin and saying, yeah, I know it's sin, and I won't stop even for Jesus. So what about that person? That person who says, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I made a profession of faith. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Yeah, I know this is sin, but I won't stop even for Jesus. What about that person? Well, have you ever heard the term cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance, just a fancy term for, it's kind of like a mental conflict that you have, right? Whenever you have two beliefs, or maybe in this case it would be a belief and a practice that just don't fit together, right? And it makes you very, very uncomfortable, right? Whenever, whenever you can't get these things right. And so a person who's living one way and yet professing another way, you're going to feel that tension. You're going to feel this cognitive dissonance. And so I think it's pretty safe to say that it typically goes one way or the other, right? A person can only stand that kind of tension for so long. And so one route they might go if they're able to do this, some are more able to do this than others, I guess, but just to go into like a delusional self-deception, right? Just, just to deceive yourself and say, oh no, all is well, and, and, and just be totally delusional and, and really continue in, in this, um, continue in this tension, but somehow kind of relieve it in your own mind at least, right? But, but you're professing one thing, you're living a completely different way. And so some try to do that, and, and, and maybe for some time they can sustain this kind of just delusional self-deception to where they think all is well. But then for others that are living in this tension, and, uh, and, and, they, and they can't stand it, and then finally it just leads them to deny the faith. I've, I've seen this happen to someone very, very close to me, right? And, and it's... Uh, and it's um, it's devastating. It's devastating to see how destructive sin can be, not only in the life to come, but in this life as well. And so, whichever, whichever a person might be, whether they're just in delusional self-deception or whether they deny the faith, to such a person, such a person will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul is getting at, right? He says, 
I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is, those who deliberately, continually live in these sins unrepentantly, regardless of what they profess, right? They're either delusional or they will end up denying the faith altogether. But such a person will not inherit the kingdom of God, the Scriptures say. But for those who, who will inherit the kingdom of God, well, these will be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, right? So again, we, we, see, we see first of all in the first section here, these competing desires. Right? We have these fleshly desires, we have these spiritual desires, but ultimately for the person who has the Spirit dwelling within them, um, they will walk according to the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh, And then as we uh, move on in the passage, we see uh, kind of what is representative of those who are in the flesh and what is representative of those who are in the Spirit. And so we've considered the flesh, and now we look at the Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Now notice, it is not called the works of the Spirit, but it's called the fruit of the Spirit. That's really significant because it's called the works of the flesh, Right? They could have said the, the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit or the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit. I have some ideas as to maybe why the word works is used for works of the flesh. But let's just focus on the Spirit. Why, if he uses the word works for flesh, why doesn't it say the works of the Spirit? Well, consider the context of Galatians. Um, Galatians is, is all about... Uh, it's combating the idea that we can be justified by works, by the works of the law. In fact, Paul says in Galatians, no one will be justified by works of the law. What we have in, in Galatia is that there are people who are saying, in order to be a Christian, in order to be saved, you have to be circumcised as the old covenant requires. You have to follow these old covenant laws. You have to follow this certain code, right? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not just uh, Jesus that saves us, but we must follow these Old Testament laws. And, uh, and Paul is coming against that very, very strongly. He's saying, no, it is through Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus that we're saved, not by works of the law, which some of that language I use there is also from Ephesians, right? So, so this, is, this is a thing that we see uh, throughout the letters. But especially in Galatians, <coughs> he's, com- he's combating this uh, idea that, that we can be justified by works of the law, which just also explains verse 18. In verse 18, it says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why does he say that? Well, because, again, uh, he, he's making the point that, that we are, uh, to, to borrow some language from Romans, right, that we are not uh, following the written code, but we are, to, uh, that we are to walk according to the Spirit. And so, make no mistake, this passage is anything but legalistic, Right? Maybe as, as we were talking about all of these works of the law and, and how these works of the law um, uh, can condemn a person, it might come across to say that, okay, or sorry, the works, of the works of the flesh is what I meant to say, uh, but, but I, it might come across to, to, as, as saying that, okay, this, this is somehow legalistic, but in fact, it's quite the opposite. Paul is laboring to show that he's not advocating for works righteousness. While it's true that unbelievers are going to have certain works that... Um, uh, that characterize them, and believers are going to have certain fruits that characterize them. The point is that believe, for believers, it's not, it's not works, but it's fruit. Right? Or to put it another way, these, it's, not the, it's not the roots of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. What's the root? What's the root of our righteousness? Right? Because uh, in order to be saved, we must find some kind of righteousness in order to stand before God on the day of judgment. And so the question is, in, in what do we find our righteousness? Well, um, we see that the root of our righteousness is Christ. The root of our righteousness is, uh, is, is um, uh, Christ uh, to whom we are connected by faith, right? Through faith in him and through what Jesus has done, through his perfect um, obedience to the law and his death for our sins, that's how we're saved, right? That is the root of our righteousness. But then there is also a fruit of our righteousness. 
Right? These are things that flow from a heart that has been transformed by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And so again, it's, it's hugely significant that Paul uses the word fruit here instead of the word works here. And that's consistent with the whole theme of Galatians that, hey, it's not works of the law that save us. Yes, it's true that if, if you are living uh, according to the works of the flesh, then you're in big trouble, right? Because that, that's showing that you are not truly born again, that you do not have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. But if you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you, then that's what saves you. It's Jesus who saves you, not, not the works of the Spirit, but it's the fruit of the Spirit that flows from that. Okay? And so... Um, The root of our righteousness is faith, which connects us to the very righteousness of Christ. But the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, there is a sense in which we should actively pursue these things, right? We We want to seek to be joyful, loving people, and so on. But we must do so totally dependent upon Christ, upon His Spirit living within us, right? Hence, fruit of the Spirit, Right? So the word fruit is significant, right? Because it shows it's not a work, but it's something that, that comes from a different, from, from a root, from a root of faith in Christ. So the word fruit is significant, but the word spirit is also significant because it's, it's saying that this is something that flows from uh, the Spirit of God living within us and that we're dependent upon the Spirit. And so we pursue these things, but we do so dependent upon the Spirit. So these next few weeks, uh, we're going to be taking a closer look at all of these fruits, right? These, these fruits that should characterize our lives as believers. These fruits that give evidence that we have the Spirit of God living within us. These fruits that flow from walking in the Spirit. Um, these fruits that will really show that we're being conformed to the image of Christ, in fact, we're going to ask a couple of questions of these fruits. And so uh, as we look at each of these, we're going to ask first, how did Jesus exemplify these? And then next we're going to ask how these might look in our own lives. All right, so that's what we're going to do in the weeks to come. But even now, as we come to a close, I, w- I, want, to take, I want to encourage you to take a moment to reflect on these. All right, so um, first week, next week, uh, we're, we're going to look at love, joy, and peace. Just think for a moment in your own mind. Um, how did Jesus exemplify these? How did Jesus exemplify love, joy, and peace? And how might these look in our own lives? And then the next week, patience, kindness, goodness. How did Jesus exemplify these? And how might these look in our own lives? And then faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Same questions, right? We, we, see, we see these, I think, so clearly in Jesus. And then by His Spirit dwelling within us, we are to produce these same fruits in our own lives. Paul says, against such things there is no law. That is to say that this is what pleases God, right? And so again, you know, in, uh, in the church uh, in Galatia, they're saying, okay, you've got to, you know, every, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, you know, if, if, you, if, you want to have, if you want to have salvation in Christ, well, you need to be circumcised. You need to follow all of these, you know, lists, uh, these Old Testament laws. <coughs> well, Paul is, Paul is saying, hey, that's, that's not what pleases the Lord, right? We, we, are, we are no longer under this law, but we are to live according to the Spirit, and these are the fruits of living and walking in the Spirit. You know, Romans 8, 8 through 9 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Right? If you are in the flesh, if you are um, living according to the flesh, you cannot please God. But he goes on to say, you, ho- you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Right? So if God's Spirit dwells in you, then we should see these fruits. And again, we participate in, in, in developing these fruits. We should pursue these fruits, but we do it dependent upon the Spirit. We don't, we don't do it to say, okay, I'm going to have love, joy, peace. I'm going to have all these things so that way I can make sure that I'm saved. No, no, that, that's coming out of the wrong way. 
right? That's, that's the whole works righteousness that, that he's coming against, right? It's not the works of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. And so there's some nuance here, right? But, but suffice it to say that these are things that we pursue, but we do it dependent upon the Spirit, right? We walk in the Spirit, and we recognize that, that the root is Christ in our faith that connects us to Christ. But then through that, uh, through God's Spirit living within us, we begin to produce these fruits, and these show evidence that we are Christians. So, whether you are lured by licentious living uh, or legalism, which, by the way, legalism is itself a work of the flesh, it's just a different brand, right? The message to us is do not gratify the desires of the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Walk in step with the Spirit, right? These are all different phrases that he uses here. That's what we're called to, and that's, um, and that's what we're going to be looking at as we look at the fruit of the Spirit. So let's pray now as we come to a close. God, we thank you for this passage. <coughs> we pray that as we, uh, these next few weeks, look at these individual fruits of the Spirit, help us to uh, see, see Jesus, uh, see Jesus' uh, beauty and glory in it, and, and, uh, and that we would be spurred along to produce good fruit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.